Hello there, and welcome to Super Structures. Today, we are diving into the Sahara Desert, a truly unforgiving place. It's one of the driest, hottest, and most massive deserts on our planet. Now you might think, why even think about putting a solar plant here? Well, the answer lies in the potential of solar energy. Deserts like the Sahara seem perfect for solar panels. They're huge, kind of flat, have lots of silicone, which is crucial for panels, and they're never short on sunlight. In fact, there's so much sunlight that if we covered a tiny piece of the Sahara with solar panels, we could power the entire United States. Yes, you heard that right. A small piece could even handle all of Europe's power needs. And if we covered just 1.2% of the Sahara with solar panels, we could generate enough energy for the whole world. So why aren't we doing it? Let's find out. It's not just the biggest desert on Earth. It's also one of the largest landscapes you'll find anywhere. To give you a sense of its vastness, picture this. It spans across a whopping 11 different countries and roughly covers an area as big as Canada, the USA, or China. And when you imagine the Sahara, you might think of endless sand dunes. But that's not the whole story. Actually, only about 20% of the Sahara is made of sand dunes. The remaining 80% is a mix of rugged mountains, extensive sandstone formations, and vast gravel plains. And here's the real kicker. The Sahara gets an astonishing amount of energy from the sun. In fact, it receives more than 100 times the energy that all of humanity consumes in a year. Now you might think it's impossible to harness all that energy pouring into the desert, but capturing even a portion of it could provide societies with an abundance of clean power. This could potentially lead to one of the most significant economic surges ever witnessed in Africa. Picture this, it could power the entire continent and create a surplus of energy for Europe. But here's the catch. While the sun's energy is essentially free and limitless, the same can't be said for the materials and costs needed to make such a dream come true. The price tags attached to these ambitious plants often reach the trillion dollar mark. But that hasn't deterred some companies from trying. One notable initiative was Desert Tech, led by Germany with plans for a massive half trillion dollar investment fund. Their vision was to invest in power generation and transmission infrastructure throughout Africa and the Middle East. Back in the 2000s, when the idea was conceived, renewable energy technologies like solar and wind were still relatively new and expensive. A group of physicists and engineers from Germany and North Africa developed the Desert Tech concept. It was based on a simple idea. It's more cost-effective to produce solar energy on a large scale in Africa and transport it to Europe, rather than generating it directly in Europe. This idea gained traction because it appeared to be the most economically sound path for a European energy transition. It was an attractive proposition for many companies as it aligned with forward-thinking sustainability goals and maintained the dominance of major corporations, given that only these giants could handle the technological and financial scale involved in such a project. The Desert Tech plan focused on concentrated solar power, which differs from the photovoltaic solar panels that were relatively costly at the time. Their concept involved scattering mirrors across the Sahara and Arabian deserts, particularly along the desert perimeters. This approach was chosen because the lack of infrastructure made building in the heart of the desert both challenging and expensive. However, ambitious plans like those of Desert Tech encountered a multitude of challenges and opposition. It turns out that harnessing desert power is much more complex than it initially appears. One of the main hurdles was the issue of energy transportation. While the Sahara can produce an abundance of energy, if it's not going to be consumed on-site, it must be transmitted to regions where it can be sold for profit, especially in Europe. To make this possible, extensive cross-Mediterranean power lines would need to be deployed, capable of transmitting electricity over long distances with minimal losses. Nothing of this scale had ever been constructed before. Even the most advanced power cables, no matter how technologically sophisticated, lose approximately 3% of the energy for every 1,000 kilometers they transmit. The longest power transmission line currently in operation is in Brazil, known as the Rio Madeira Line, which transports power over a distance of roughly 2,400 kilometers. For Desert Tech to become a reality, the energy would need to travel over 3,000 kilometers from the Sahara to Europe. 
While the technology for this type of transmission infrastructure is available, it's bound to significantly reduce the profit margins for every energy project planned in the Sahara. Even if the engineering challenges of energy transportation were to be solved, the projects couldn't escape their next obstacle, the lack of infrastructure. Given that most of the Sahara is uninhabited, covering a large portion of the area with solar generators wouldn't displace communities or local wildlife. However, the low population density proved to be a double-edged sword. The absence of local infrastructure made construction unnecessarily difficult and costly. The heart of the Sahara is almost completely devoid of anything resembling a transportation network, which makes mega-project construction a major challenge. New roads and support infrastructure would need to be constructed before making further progress into the desert, and this would undoubtedly cut into the project's profit margins. To compound the issue, financial constraints, infrastructure deficiencies, and engineering challenges were not the only obstacles blocking the path of these plans. One of the key reasons behind the Desert Tech Initiative's failure in the 2010s was the strong opposition it encountered from experts who highlighted the potential for geopolitical complexities and European dependence on foreign nations. Establishing a direct power connection with Africa could be vulnerable to disruptions and possibly used as a tool for manipulation. Furthermore, the unstable political climate in the region made it challenging for foreign investors to commit to long-term planning and investments. These investors were understandably cautious, especially in volatile countries. For instance, the 2013 attack on the BP natural gas plant in Algeria illustrated the risks. The plant was situated on a transit route for Al-Qaeda forces, making it an attractive target for militias. With events like the Arab Spring in 2010 and ongoing conflicts in the Arab world, the practical realization of the desert tech concept of power exchange between Europe and the Sahara region became increasingly complex. During the same period, the power market in Europe had reached a state of saturation. Falling oil prices and the political climate in Europe didn't favor establishing more dependencies on Arabian energy markets. Taking all of these challenges into account, the appeal of investing in large-scale solar power projects in the Sahara Desert diminished, leading to several unsuccessful initiatives in the region. Another significant factor in altering the course of events was the substantial decrease in the cost of solar photovoltaics over the past decade. This change worked against Desert Tech's initial plants, which were primarily based on concentrated solar thermal energy. In today's market, solar photovoltaics have become so cost-effective that European nations can now construct their solar projects within their own borders, while remaining competitive with fossil fuels and other electricity generation methods. What are your thoughts on this concept? Should we continue to develop more solar farms in the Sahara? Share your opinions in the comments below. If you'd like to explore similar topics, be sure to subscribe to Superstructures. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next video.